Hello, and welcome to the Incinerator Art Award 2020 Symposium. My name is Jake Tracy, curator at Incinerator Gallery, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from where I broadcast today, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respect to their spirits, ancestors, elders and community members past and present, and recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Furthermore, I pay respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be tuning into today's conversation. As part of the Incinerator Art Award 2020, we'll be exploring four key themes of social justice across four video conversations, underscoring how art may bring about social change. In this talk, I am joined by artists Kiniani Tanoa Roberts, Kate Just, and Tal Fitzpatrick, who lead the COVID 19 Quilt Project, Jayanto Tan, Shivanjani Lal, and Baruni Kanagasandaram, as we explore the theme Time and Healing. I have asked the artists four provocations. What does time look like? feel like, sound like, smell or taste like? What does healing look, feel, sound, smell or taste like? Can time inform healing or healing inform time? And if so, how? And also what experiences of time or healing do you as artists hope that your audiences encounter in your work? Kiniani, perhaps we can open the discussion with yourself. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your work in the Incinerator Art Award and how time encountered in your work is informed by Indigenous Maori time and also time spent during COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what does time smell and taste like? For me, it it's salt water. <laughs> and um, in my culture, um, traditionally, before colonization, um, time was often determined by the tide. So time could be different on one side of the island to the other. So it's, um, and I think also for heal healing for me is also salt water. It's tears. Um, and it's, it's putting myself, um, connecting to the land and to bodies of water. So it's the same answer to those two questions for me. Um, yeah, my work, um, I think it's easy to see differences between cultures um, when it comes to things like food or languages, but something like a concept of time, we often don't think there are cultural differences around. We, we tend to assume that um, our dominant understanding of time is, is a universal truth, that that applies to everyone. Um, so, yeah, my work is, is, a, is quite a personal work of healing for myself. Um, I, I, working as a, as a um, paid creative <laughs> where you're sort of working to deadlines and you're, you're selling your skills as an hourly rate was, was such, a, it's such a challenging experience uh, for me and I'm sure for most other humans really, especially um, in the creative industry. Um, and I really started to think about it last year, um, this kind of concept of time as a commodity and, and that our, our predominant experience of time, of clock time is, you know, productivity. And, um, you know, that we have this idea that we have to be always being productive, that time spent in idleness is a waste of time. And, and there's actually a morality around that. There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a set of values around that, that if, if you're not being productive, you're being lazy or, yeah. So in my work, I guess for me, that idea of time was very linear. It was very black and white and it, and it, it painted the world for me. It filled the world like wallpaper for me. So in my work, that concept of time is represented as, as this big roll of wallpaper in black and white typography and, um, and then I wanted to disrupt that. I wanted to disrupt that concept with these spinning tops, which, which were random and, 
which represented kind of different experiences so and that people could interact with and people could kind of ask the question how much self-determination do we have over our experiences of time um i think the work started to become kind of more profound for me as COVID lockdown started to happen and i started to hear people around me talking about their experiences of sort of stepping outside of clock time. They didn't have to be at the tram station at 8 a.m. Um, you know, for a lot of us, our whole experience of time is determined by a school routine or a work routine, even when we eat, when we sleep, where we have to be. Um, we very rarely step outside of that. Maybe four weeks a year when we're on holidays, we step outside of that. But but once the world shut down and there wasn't this collective experience of time, all of a sudden people were experiencing time in different ways. Maybe, you know, we were listening to our body clocks as a measure of time. You know, we slept when we were tired. We woke up when we were ready. We ate when we were hungry. For the first time ever, the world is kind of, um, yeah, our warping of time is kind of weaving through. So I was really interested in that idea and, um, and, have it's the beginning of a conversation around what are our experiences around this and and how that determines our quality of life and our connection to our environment as well i really love that idea hiniani that the disruption of time can lead to senses of autonomy and something that is more grounded connect going back to talking about salt water and, and, and salt and connected to the land and connected to the water, that we start to become more connected to the flow or the rhythm of natural ways. It's something that um, it starts to disrupt that, uh, that other sort of economic clock and maybe the circadian or the celestial clock starts to kick back into rhythm again. I like that the engagement and the interaction within your work of allowing audience members to physically come up to the, to, the, to the installation and spin the tops in a way that it sort of like allows chance to also start to flow into this, that you know, allows for us to maybe give ourselves up and over to powers and um, energies unseen uh, that do lay perhaps dormant within us as well. So this also is like a quietening down period. It is a waking up period for other senses well, uh, I remember we were talking earlier in the lead up to this exhibition, the, the um, traditional story about the spinning tops. And I was wondering if you could share that with us. Yeah, absolutely. Spinning tops. Uh, yeah, Ngāpōtaka is, um, it's actually a traditional Māori uh, thing. Uh, we, we have been making spinning tops for a long time and they're often wooden, um, especially in um, in my iwi, in the part of New Zealand I come from, one of our pūrākos, our stories um, from our ancestors is, is involves uh, spinning tops and they were used for competitions and for games. And I kind of, I, I really, um, in my work, I like to play with my, the traditional kind of iconography and symbology in my culture. I, I feel like these symbols that we have um, our technologies. They hold information um, coming from an oral culture. Um, a lot of the patterns and the geometry um, which appears in our artwork, in our tattooing, in our um, carving, it's, it holds information. It's, it was a way of storing um, and, and passing on information. So it's a technology in itself, which is why I kind of refer to it as iconography, which is a modern word, but I really like this idea that iconography itself um, is timeless. It, it actually transports through time. It can be thousands of years old and it can still be relevant a thousand years in the future. Um, and it's, it's relevant, um, it, it's, not, it's not bound by a language. So icons you know, can be used in pe with people that speak different languages and because they're pictorial, we can understand them. Um, so yeah, the idea of the spinning top kind of came as I was playing. It's a, it's, it's a toy. Um, it's something we play with. It's also round, you know, and these kind of round concepts of time rather than a linear concept. I wanted to contrast that idea. And I, I thought, yeah, spinning top is kind of an interesting symbol. It's beautifully articulated in the artwork, Kiniani. I really like the idea. Maybe we can pick this up later on in our conversations, but the idea of, um, play as healing 
maybe that is an idea that that um, uh, manifests in the time that we spend. Um, uh, you know, how how is time spent as well is another question. Time spent in culture, time spent in community. Uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about, as you were saying, the holding and the storing of information that is woven into materiality, which maybe is a really nice segue into Kate and Tal's uh, project, the COVID-19 quilt project. Um, and I was wondering, Kate and Tal, if you could tell us a little bit more about how this project came about and the importance of community participation in this project. Do you want me to take part one and you can take part two, Tal? <laughs> um, so I guess how it came about was um, in April of this year, we were already a couple of weeks into um, restrictions around COVID in Victoria. And Tal and I had been working together for some years. Um, I was Tal's PhD supervisor um, at the VCA and she um, did a project which was centering on craftivism and its potential to address social change issues. Um, and I myself work with craft and participation um, and community participation in my own practice. So we've worked on each other's projects before, um, but we'd never done a project together. And we just, in conversation, reached out to each other and recognized that um, that one of the most significant, immediately significant things about COVID-19 was the lack of touch and connection that people had um, and the fear of not being able to touch each other or, you know, being instructed not to touch other people anymore. Um, and so that lack of tactility and touch and community, um, we thought we want to create something that allows people to have that sense of being connected. Um, and so we started, for those who don't know, the COVID-19 quilt is an Instagram account and it's a virtual quilt. And so people from all around the world can submit a square and they submit it with their name, their city and their country and a little story about their experience of COVID-19. Um, and so we started it and we just put it out there with instructions and it was translated into many different languages as well. Um, and we started getting uh, submissions from all around the world really quickly within the first day they started coming in um, and it's really held a lot of the complexities of COVID-19 everything from health concerns personal issues loss medical um, experiences uh, all the all the inequities um, all the inequities that have occurred across the year, economic, racial, cultural, social, everything has been recorded in the quilt through the narratives and stories that have um, come in. And so Tal, maybe you want to pick up the community participation. Yeah. So like to date, I'm just looking down and I think there's 430 contributions from about 26 different countries around the world so far. So they keep kind of coming in and it, it's become this interesting, speaking about time, it's becoming an interesting time capsule because as we've moved through the different phases of COVID um, and as time has gone on, you can kind of look back and see the main things that people were really concerned about or responding to or the things that were popping up in different countries. Um, at different points in time. So you, it's become this thing that you can kind of like look back on and track people's emotions um, in this kind of communal way. And I think the way that it connects really nicely too with the concepts of time and healing is the ways that in response to what Kate was saying, the isolation and the lack of physical connection this created a space where we could actually be reminded that we're not going through this alone and that there are other people who um, are part of our broader community so far as the online craft and creative community which is quite strong on Instagram that there were so many resonances not just within cities within countries but at, at a global scale and then as time went on it became a really interesting site where we could learn about how different communities were being impacted differently and how pre-existing pressures and um, kind of uh, how different 
political responses to this um, problem were causing different kinds of outcomes for different communities. So in that sense, it's become a really important um, time capsule of those stories as well. Mm. It's a very um, uh, generous project in creating those linkages, creating those bridges, um, and also a project that I think is very accessible insofar that it doesn't exist exclusively within a gallery and potentially some of those um, particular conditions or expectations um, uh, or qualifications that one might need to experience artwork within such a space. By taking it out of that space, it becomes accessible and sort of exists beyond time as well. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is a really beautiful bridge. And, and I want to move to Jayanto now to talk about the idea of bridging across place and across identity and across time as well. Because your work in the award also creates a bridge of healing between the past to the present and from trauma to healing. And Jayanto, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about some of those ideas and, and also the important influences that underpin this work. Uh, yeah, um, my work has a lot to do with the memory, mm. time, healing, and, and also hope. And uh, I hope that people can see what is in there. They're not just looking. And what, what this work, I uh, inspired by the Cuban artist called Felix Gonzalez Torres, that the work speak about um, race, class, and sexuality. This work, I use a clay. I love working with clay. I like the texture and the senses of smell and also the process of making from, you know, from raw to cook. From that we can, you know, it's also express the feeling, how, how, how is it like from like a, from, you know, from the soft to heart mm -hmm. to get the senses of my, um, my, uh, my lab experience as a migrant. Um, this work is, uh, <laughs> I have to say this, um, this work is the most, the most painful and the most banal, banal because I just, it's, the media is a very, um, very simple. You know, I could make the media, you no, know, like a glazed way like this, but this is only just, there's a this fire and with under glass. So something very simple and get you into the public. So, um, yeah, so the work is very, um, very, uh, very painful and very banal and had to do, had to do with uh, life, loss and loves, memories, fears, um, what else? Um, voice, being shamed and rejected and, uh, and expecting the reason of being. Um, this simple object, you know, one see when you look at that in the photograph, that the simple object is um, it is set it's the middle of nowhere. It's like a you no, know, where is the place? It's the kind of like on the street in middle of nowhere. So they are just really waiting, waiting for you no, know, I don't know, <laughs> getting what they get for healing. They like waiting get been murder. <laughs> they waiting get you no know, get survived. We don't know. It's all like, like more lot a lot of like, like question. And the timing, what timing get what something like that. So um, um, so no, the the tongue is you can see all white, but the it tongue. Uh, the soul is painted with the the rainbow flat colors. So um, that no. How to say it? It's mm -hmm. um so. The color, which is uh, out of the sign, of the sign, so um, I mean the exhibit not only the appreciation of queers, but also the complex set of power relation fell in negotiating the flight for equality. So furthermore, um, my hope, you no, know, for the ways this work has enabled sharing of migrant ex experiences and making friends and contribute toward feeling a little less alone. Mm. Um, yeah, I hope, you no, know, La Familia, I get the touch La Familia because you feel like, you know, 
family. Each family is like a very basic thing. Everybody want to have family. Don't have to be described like, oh, you can have family because you are, you can have family because you be. So this will kind of like, no, resources that, no. I hope that their family are resorted with the toll still, still afraid to express the true identity and, and the feelings and encourage it they find the courage to stand up for, you know, for our rights or LGBTQI rights and the human rights, I guess. Mm. I, yeah, Jayanto, I love that idea as well of um, talking about uh, healing through connectivity in a particular family. As you were talking, it made me think um, again of the work that Hey and Tal do in leading the COVID-19 quilt, that this in a way forms family it forms kinship that's beyond uh, blood or bone. This is something that is inherently queer and using that queerness as a model as well to find healing through our chosen family is really important. Uh, in your work as well, Jayanto, you have chosen to the, the, uh, the symbol of the shoe. And there are three sets, is that right? Three sets of shoes. It's uh, two. So two, two set of tongues, they could be yes, symbolism of the adults. And that would be the one is the under, the underneath have the rainbow colors because we can identify who they are. But the two others is uh, one pair of shoes and one pair of tongs, but it's nothing, you can't identify who they are because you know, they are just, you know, children, whatever it is. So children, we don't identify as what it is, but the adult, we identify as the queers. So kind of the idea to, you know, to giving a hope for the queers having a family, <laughs> like a simple thing, you know what I mean? But it's uh, but I have to be careful when I'm saying it because, you know, it's, I come from, you know, being me is like unacceptable, hundredly unacceptable. So I have to be really very careful to say what I'm going to say because I don't want to hurt people. Because the reason I come here, I want to make friends. I want to express my feeling. This is the basic of human being. Why I can why I can be by myself in my own home place, you know, my home born place where I was grew up in there, was I was playing there, but suddenly I I was being persecuted because I was different. I don't think I'm different. I just think, you know, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe you jack, you know more than me to say that thing. So it's like a, I want just want to be like everyone, like you know, I mean, even here though, I want just really be like everyone. I don't see like, you know, you and me like another people is different and this we just are part of the human being so through my work i hope this is gonna get a sense of the healing the thing but i don't want getting too deep because in the end it got so emotional because my work is very emotional it's very very personal and take me a lot of courage to express the work they want I, i'm also i'm from i come from very um basic simple family so thing is to set thing it, for me, it's very hard because I was grow up not saying thing, not saying thing like very emotional thing. Everything all fine, everything all good, everything good. Even you don't have to, even you don't eat a week, uh, one month, you just everything fine. Get something we can eat. You eat that, you fine, you could be fine. So I grew up kind of like this. So for me, it's like another level to express my feeling in my art. So my art kind of like my healing also come at my time to, just, to get mm. to get through that, and. Also, like Jack, you say it's uh, about like the COVID-19 now. For me, for some reason, like, you know, you've been isolated almost like uh, almost six months now, I think. So just kind of the thing might make me feel like, okay, I hope, you know, we can, we all can get through this and through, you know, through um, process of making art. And then, um, yeah, so um, back again to the healing thing is i feel like you know every time i touch the clay i feel like okay here we are here we go again so i back to my basic to everyday life you said my work very simple very very banal like it's like nothing really special what i can say the why for me it's very very um very homey like you know very basic thing like for, for, for to get the better life like hoping and time one day hope to, we all get you no know, met together doesn't say you are uh because you can have that you will be you can have that you know what i'm saying something like that anyway i hope i, I can do. start i uh Jayanto, i do know what you're saying and thank you for um sharing that very personal response to your work i think that it um highlights another idea that 
many of us as creatives encounter as well that art can be a mode for healing and healing through trauma. Um, the importance to recognize trauma, however that may be encountered for us, leads to a very beautiful place. And I often, I, I, I really love this analogy and I may have said it before through a talk, but the idea of how, like how a pearl is made, the idea of the pearl um, originating from a singular granule of sand, like traveling through the currents of an ocean and per chance becoming lodged within the mouth of a mollusk or, or an oyster. And as it does, it creates an aberration, a scar, a cut. And the mouth of the mollusk knows that it's something that is an intruder and that it is a wound. And so it starts to tongue where that granule of sand has, has become lodged into its side. And as it tongues it with nacre, which is the mother of pearl, lick by lick and coat by coat, it starts to actually form this solid, beautiful, glistening pearl. And so without the wound, we don't have the pearl. And I suppose that can be said as well to find the kinship with trauma and healing and the importance of spending time to look after that, to nourish it so that it can be transformed. That transformative power that can be attained through repetition through ritual. Maybe that's also a really nice tie into Shivanjani, your work in uh, the award as well, speaks very much towards ritual and, and in particular, your work involves the act of burning haldi or turmeric as that healing ritual that's passed down uh, by Indian women. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that healing act uh, and also about the artwork itself and how that inherently translates across generations and, and therefore time. Um, so I guess uh, like me and like many others, I, I um, found myself at the very start of COVID uh, with uh, back at home. Um, and uh, I think I'd, I'd, I'd also kind of lost work and had materials that I was no longer using for the purpose that they were supposed to be used for. And so all of a sudden I had bags of air dried clay that I was supposed to be doing a project with other women. And, and so I was like, okay, let's, let's see what I can do here. And, um, and so I sort of started making small air dried clay bowls and dipping them into turmeric or haldi. And I, and I know that this year is the centenary of the end of an, the abolition of indentured labor. And for me, this moment in time is a funny moment because it's, it's, it's almost like an unrecorded stopping because really um, that moment kind of still exists. It's uh, like the, 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 the peak, like I think that there were dates this sort of dates between 2015 and 2020 that sort of allude to the like the the movement of bodies across oceans stopping but people who did move across the ocean during that period of time still had to see out their contracts and so um there's a date in 2020 where all of those contracts cease and so for me looking at i guess this number 100 was something that i was interested in and sort of making these bowls sort of um, was a really nice thing to kind of was con contemplative and, and sort of quite a physical act to kind of try and do like use my hands while I was waiting. Um, simultaneously, I was dealing with some uh, family things. My, my dad was in hospital right at the start of COVID. And, and so uh, I was sort of trying to occupy my time um, and thinking about what does a ritual look like or what can I do as a ritual um, and also like the, the the I guess like the little bowls that I made uh, look like deer which are like candle holders and um, and I'm Hindu and I, I often think about like how in different communities in use burning as a ritual and and in western cultures it feels like burning is like a negative thing whereas it, like i've never felt that way and so um i think connecting these points came about through the performance and the work 
is a, a, a video of me sort of burning a hundred deers uh, in my backyard. Um, and I think it's also really important that it is in my backyard in Australia. There's something about the fact that actually there is a responsibility of Australia Pacific Islands. Um, I mean, in the last few days, I've been hearing a lot about South Sea Islanders and the responsibility Australia has towards blackbirding. But that same labor law was the labor law that enabled in Fijians to be in India, like Indians to be in Fiji. And so mm -hmm. there's like no, like there's no conversation about that yet. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think maybe this gesture is about trying to figure out ways to be accountable mm -hmm. or what does accountability look like? Because I'm obviously very privileged and I, 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 you know, I'm able to spend, like I have, I have a backyard that I can make an artwork in, which is in and of itself really ridiculous. Um, because if I was still in Fiji, that's not a thing. They'd be like, what do you like? That's stop doing that, do something productive or whatever productive means. Um, and so uh, these are things that I've been thinking a lot about, especially because last year I was in Fiji and I caught up with my uncle or I, I he picked up my uncle on the side of the road and he was on his way to, FSC, which is the Fiji Sugar Company. And he said something to me, which really struck home, which was that what happens when I go, because my children don't want to take up my role as a sugar cane farmer. And his legacy is our history. And so if he goes, then, then, then the indentured labor community just disappears. And so I think at the moment I'm trying to, create these small moments of accountability or, or something that enables a conversation to occur. Um, and I think being, um, using the number 100 is a way to kind of <clears throat> be both accountable to myself, but to that relationship. For sure. Absolutely. Siobhan Jani, I think uh, the idea of the artwork as a record and then therefore your role as an artist as somewhat almost as an archiver to allow for the stories to continue beyond generations and so that they're not completely lost at you know at the passing of one individual as maybe like that knowledge keeper and i suppose the materials that you use in your work do demonstrate that responsibility that's taken I love that the initial idea for the artwork was actually meant to be hugely collaborative. Mm. Did you intend maybe to have, um, when you were saying that you're collaborating with other people or other women in particular to have a hundred um, individuals? Um, I think if, I think originally I had been looking at different types of collaborative works. I had been working on a project with um, a women's well, not a women's group, but a, um, a new refugee group uh, in uh, Rydalmere in Western Sydney. And I had been sort of, a lot of them are of South Asian descent and I'd been looking at sort of using um, spices and things to kind of create maybe like a collaborative bigger work. I don't, I didn't know what that looked like just quite yet. Um, and uh, literally the week that it happened, like the, 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 that week of COVID, multiple things happened and, and, uh, and it, like it, it, it just became like it, it, it didn't, it wasn't even feasible to think about an outcome, if you will. Like, I think, I think we had, I, I, I think I was planning to make a series of beads with that original, um, uh, I guess, mental project. And, and maybe that'll still happen like sometime down the track, but at the moment, um, I mean, we're still not doing group-based activities in Sydney. Um, uh, I mean, we're certainly enabled to be out and, and about more and I, you know, but certainly, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't even know what that looks like anymore. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think there's, um, that is something that we've touched on a couple of times in our conversation already. Hey, that um, touch and contact and physical presence with community is vital for our ongoing collaborations and storytellings and uh, 
and collective healing as well. I want to use that idea to uh, flow into Baruni's project that uh, also talks about collaboration and talks about communal and collective healing. And Varuni, your work in the Incinerator Art Award um, celebrates different traditions as a way to connect through, as you say, that universal language of humanity. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, your practice in ritual and art and collaboration and how those narratives of diversity commune for healing. Thank you, Jake. Um, um, my, my work generally, it has got its origins in uh, where my childhood upbringing in Sri Lanka, in northern parts of Sri Lanka. And, and often they are related to as, uh, rituals and translating those rituals. And my relationship to senses in, and how senses are translated as well. And, um, and how our body, so one of touch, gestures, feet, washing, all that is um, then conveyed. But these performative aspects, gestural aspects where materiality, it can show up in materiality as well, can articulate a language that, that, will, that can become universal, such that you do not need to know the, the details of the ritual per se, but it can be interpreted across any tradition. So that's where my creative practice sits. And I draw these elements from those Tamil or South Asian traditions, ritual practices. Um, and the work um, I did uh, for Incinerator um, Art Award um, addresses um, loss and trauma of women, who are mourning the loss of men in the civil war that lasted uh, three decades or so. And it ended in 2009, but of course the trauma continues and the healing therefore continues. And many of, uh, like it's, um, and losses, um, even though it is, it has its origin again in this, um, particular event or ev events, event that lasted many decades, it also reaches out to other countries where conflicts have contributed to loss and women um, and because I, I bring the perspective of the feminine and a mother losing, losing a husband, losing a son and how can we as community uh, hold her mm. through ritual, um, uh, through a ritual practice or ritual uh, gestures? So just to elaborate on how community came, and this was done um, in the US where it was a broad cross-section of traditions. So there were Native Americans, there were African Americans, and there were Anglo-Saxons, um, Hispanic, uh, all came. And it was entering uh, a house as though it was the house of, of the person who was in mourning. And um, they came and sat down on the ground and the these are elements that bring about a connectedness without having to um, really explain why they're sitting on the ground they can um, they have a feeling that 
there is a uh, it has got a connection to the uh, traditions of the East, but yet sitting on the ground also connects you to Earth. And using elements of pigment, and I work with clay, so the tactility of clay is an important aspect of it. And uh, they were invited to respond to what it is um, of, of, of loss in, from, from their own experience. Um, so not to necessarily externalize it, but imagine what uh, their own, draw upon their own experience of loss and therefore offer it um, and uh, as, a, as, a, as a gesture of offering for her. And they sat across in pairs um, such that each, each is being supported by the other. In the middle is um, a fragment of a white sari and the white is the color of mourning. And as they open it, you know, you know, again, it's presented like a visually like a ritual and pigments and clay and slip are all present and they draw or write in any language or they are visual signs. Um, the many were uh, visual signs of what loss looked like or felt like um, and what healing looked like or felt like. And that tactility and touch were a very important part. And what they then did was um, these, this fragment, the, it's sitting on that textile so that the textile also holds the memory. Um, and they then um, brought each of their pieces together and pressed it such that that me memory is captured. So it's really about memory, but memory also being part of the participant's experience as well. And that then that just gets um, conveyed to her. Um, and all that then, uh, so there are traces and the clay, some of uh, the, so these are shapes of, of, of a palm. So therefore the title palm reading, which is astrology. Um, and therefore these messages are uh, for, for her, our collective message is a healing for her. And then those are fired such that it captures that moment in time that we come together as a community um, to offer these repetitive act, uh, acts of, um, of ritual, but of pigment, of also using tools. So these are finger, you know, you use your finger. There are no tools per se, but um, natural elements. So I would go and pick um, leaves or twigs or whatever that's immediately around. Um, cedar um so uh those are elements that were used as tools for writing or drawing and the so some of it some of the textile of course captures the raw elements of clay and with time and the and the pigments fade with time as well so you're watching you're experiencing the um the trauma also healing with that process. So there is a timelessness with it um, and a, a, a dwelling in it. And that is part of healing. Mm. Um, and, a, and, a, and therefore a savoring. And um, I think um, Janto or Hineani, I, uh, one of you all said something about how um, and also you said as well, Jake, how sometimes trauma allows you to, or loss, allows you to engage. It's through the experience you engage with time more deeply. True, yeah. Yeah, it really it makes you engage with um, time more deeply. 
and therefore you you will bring about a greater empathy i think for uh that can go beyond an experience that you you don't know all the details but can sufficiently understand and you can reach out yeah i think it's this right can i say something jack <laughs> yes please do tell so um i think it's yeah you're right what you say that i think it's like no that one i think art is for me i don't know maybe for everyone too for me it's very important part of the healing and then the couple the trauma you know what i mean because you got so heavy history in your in your body or in your mind i don't know it's just i, I still work it out what is in my mind or my body i got no idea but for me just like making art through art actually you explore it you you transfer it to the um the very personal like trauma it's it's no way you can discuss about this yeah. and no one you can um well unless at the moment i couldn't find anyone i can trust just to explore my you know my trauma my trauma transfer the past and i didn't get anyone yet a, where i can i can explore this on my uh, heavy mind or heavy body so at the moment through art i can i can express that make and then make the trauma slightly lighter and make your life slightly lighter and everything, everything could be lighter and everything could be like a make you can, and then and then you can walk yourself in on the surface in the uh you know in the in the earth like uh Lars says, you know, in the grass, wherever it is, in the backyard, you know, when you feel like, okay, now here we are, I can, I can, um, I can stand on my, on my own land, even though it's not my land. However, I feel like that, that thing, you know, I mean, make me feel like, okay, here we go. I, I, I can get through this, you know, I mean, through art, like you said, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. process of the art healing you from the past. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, um it's an it's accessible yeah. um, it's about offering that accessibility rather than you know, it has to be done a particular way yeah um that sometimes um when people enter into those ritual spaces uh there could be some trepidation yeah as though it has to be a right way yeah, sure but if you if you somehow as the artist facilitating an allowance is created a generosity comes about mm. and i was really quite touched by how um how um generous people were with their with, with their uh, drawings or comment or um the, um of from their own experiences mm. Mm. Uh, Varuni this is also an ongoing uh project as well that travels <laughs> and moves around um uh, and I suppose with each iteration grows and develops into having that archive of work and also connecting time to place and place to time um uh, there were some other really beautiful things that you mentioned whilst you were talking about your work and your practice and color was one that came up as well when you were talking about white and white um you know for morning as well and jayanta was talking about white and shivanjani you know like you have the the yellow of the turmeric as well within your work and hinayani you know the spinning tops as well and the importance the cultural significance of color as well through to back again jayanta with the rainbow and queerness and the multicolored patchworks as well of the COVID quilt that through many we we come together to to stitch and to heal and to to be together especially during this time when we can't physically be very present with each other um and the idea of of memory as well was brought up in that conversation as well you know the that remembrance of the the number 100 you know the that date of um the abolition of indentured labor and also um, the uh, memory as well of materials being imbibed um, uh, in your work, Hiniani. And yeah, I, I feel like this is a really nice opportunity just to open that circle again. If anyone wants to comment upon other themes or topics or um, yeah, I'd like to open it up for you all. I just, I, I, I think it's so beautiful 
it's so nice to hear about all these works from you, all the synergies between the projects and, and the ways that we work and the way that we think about connecting with people and creating spaces that allow people to connect with their own interior worlds, but also to find synergies with others and to create temporary communities, whether that's as part of ritual or as part of engaging with the work, like with the spinning tops. I think I've been thinking, you know, and thinking about justice and how that links with the idea of healing and time. It's so interesting too to hear how all of our work looks to bear witness and to make records and to call for accountability. I think so many of you have kind of spoken about that. And I think it's a really good point so far as it's really hard to heal without the sense of that justice has been found like that kind of leaves you in this very traumatized vulnerable space if you can't if you don't feel like um an injustice has been acknowledged and there's been no accountability and i think it's really interesting how all of our different projects call for that justice um in in their own ways i think yeah that's good that's interesting yeah. too. that's interesting tao um because often um, visual as a visual artist, we can um, sometimes as a familiarity, say if it's uh, verbal in the media, um, there is a familiarity of phrasing or um, that one can become um, uh, just jaded by or you're not receptive anymore. And as, as creative artists, we've got a multitude of avenues to tap into in terms of senses and and um, triggering those senses and to bring about an openness from within and then and a preparedness to to look at difference perhaps as well um yeah, but to kind of hold that in a space that's compassionate and that's generous, mm. like you said, I almost feel like it create it's such a generative way to have those conversations about justice because you avoid almost that conversation about blame and being defensive and it's just like, you know, we're asking people to hold it in their hearts before we ask them to respond to it in any other way. I think it's such it's a it's a real gift, I guess, that art brings into this space. That's very well said, Tal. I agree completely. Does anyone have any other comments that they would like to make about today's topic? Um, I just, the only thing I wanted to add, if I could, just that I had the feeling as everyone was talking about their works that each of the works is an offering um, and that it's personal. So it starts from the personal or the cultural or the your own sort of narrative or experience, but then it's being offered out into community and being given as a gift. Um, and it and it's generative, as Tal says, but I just that word just kept coming up for me, the idea of an offering um, and the generosity of that and what that does. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Kate. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, it, has been, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with, e with each of you and with all of the artists in this year's Incinerator Art Award. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today and for allowing us the opportunity to dive deeper into your artistic practices. Uh, I really appreciate your time and, and, and your healing. And thank you for this excellent conversation surrounding time and healing. I would encourage our viewers to visit the Incinerator Art Award website to learn more about this year's award and the artists involved. The exhibition will be running until the 1st of November. You can visit incineratorgallery.com.au to learn more. And remember, you can vote for your People's Choice Award. This video concludes today's symposium. I thank you for joining us and I hope you have enjoyed. I hope that our conversations have inspired you whilst underscoring the imperative social 
and political role art plays towards social justice. Thank you.